thanks everyone for being here today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we're meeting on the uh, land of the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging and to their ongoing struggle for justice in Australia. Uh, I'd also like to pay respect to people with lived experience of mental <coughs> health uh, and hopefully recovery and the people who care for and support them. Uh, and we always thank people with lived experience for sharing those experiences to help us understand how we can have services that better meet their needs and help them to participate in the community of their choice. So uh, <coughs> uh, mental health carers New South Wales uh, is the peak body for families and carers of people with experience of mental illness uh, in New South Wales and we have been working closely with the Australian BPD Foundation to support the New South Wales branch of uh, the BPD Australia. Um, <coughs> Uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, Bryn Grenier, the head of project there, and a number of other uh, well-known uh, clinicians and uh, carers and consumers who I see in the audience, and thank you for being here today as well. Um, <coughs> a couple of uh, housekeeping matters uh, to start off with. Um, the fire exits are located at either end of the building. Um, if you go out into the stairwell opposite the lifts, you can uh, probably see them. Uh, the toilets are also opposite the lifts and there is a unisex disab uh, disabled access toilet at the end of the passageway. Uh, <coughs> there is a, we um, do try to practice uh, trauma-informed event management and so uh, if anyone feels distressed by anything that we discussed today, um, we have uh, some uh, rooms at the back of the offices uh, where you can go for a quiet place and we have uh, Katie and Anne, uh, Katie by the registration, Anne at the back wearing purple badges and they can support you and uh, help you in any way that you need should you get triggered by anything we discuss. Um, we also ask the people who are presenting today um, to be mindful of the information that they will be disclosing, both about themselves but also if they are carers about the people that they care for and support. And ideally, if you are going to talk about a loved one's experience, it would be preferable for you to have uh, sounded them out about that beforehand and made sure they were comfortable with what you're going to talk about. Uh, we'd also ask that if you are going to talk about anything which could be quite triggering, such as suicidality or self-harm, that maybe you uh, give the audience a little warning in case anyone would like to remove themselves while that discussion is taking place. Uh, <coughs> so without further ado, after quite a lot of housekeeping matters, I'd like to uh, introduce, uh, to launch the uh, Borderline Personality Disorder Anti-Stigma Campaign, uh, Ms. Marley Jewell, uh, a well-known activist and graphics artist uh, in BPD. Thank you. First, I would like to acknowledge that we're meeting today on Aboriginal land and pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation for thousands of years of protections of these lands. I acknowledge that this land was never ceded but stolen, and I acknowledge the great trauma and pain still caused by that theft. I also lend my voice to uphold the basic human rights of all Indigenous people of this land with respect to elders both past and present, including my own, and with solidarity for future generations. Today I also hold space for those who are no longer with us and who remind me of why I do this work. And that is, first and foremost, to end unnecessary death by suicide and overdose. In my experiences, suicide is the symptom of a broken and disconnected society, and we are all responsible for fixing it. When talking about stigma, it's important to see where we have come from. Sorry, this is really awkward holding this. Um, our experiences of the effects of stigma and discrimination are difficult to hear, but they are important and valid. There is pain here. If at any time, as Jonathan said, you feel overwhelmed, uncomfortable, triggered or distressed, I encourage you to take care of yourself. I promise you that we will finish the conversation in a better place than where we will begin. I'm here to talk about stigma and the campaign that's been launched for the 2018 BPD Awareness Week. This campaign, No BPD, No Stigma, 
has the main objective to attack stigma and discrimination using the power of facts, education, strategies for change, and using the strong voices of consumers, carers, and clinicians within the BPD community. It encourages people to know more about BPD and to say no to stigmatizing behavior. So to redesign stigma, we first have to face it head on, look at what it actually is, and then find ways to defeat it. To begin with, I needed to immerse myself in not only my experience of stigma and discrimination, as a person with lived experience, but I also needed to understand the experiences of others. The slides you will see throughout my presentation in black, white, and gray are the voices of our survey participants. They are people with lived experience with BPD, their carers, and the clinicians that work with us. The first place I started was a really simple comparison. I have a friend who has battled cancer for many years she has gone through difficult, painful treatment that has times left her depleted and hopeless. She practically lived in hospitals, being taught at by doctors. In the end, they rid her organs of the invader and she won her battle, she's now in remission. When she's spoken about, when her doctors speak about her, they use words like brave, inspiring, fighter and strong. And she is all of those things. She has scars, they show her battle and we call them tiger stripes or warrior wounds. She's also been with me as I battled, as I went through difficult, painful treatment that at times left me depleted and hopeless. She watched me practically live in hospitals, being talked at by doctors. In the end, I also won my battle. But when they talk about me, they use different language. They say, liar untrustworthy, unstable, exhausting. And when they said that, they helped me believe I was all of those things. I have scars. They show you how sick I was. People would prefer it if I didn't talk too much about them. They don't like it when I honor them. The only difference in our stories is the name that explains the issue we faced and the narrative that name carried. We run marathons to support cancer patients. We run away from people with borderline personality disorder. When we go back and we look into studies done in the 1980s that asked medical staff what they think of people with BPD, they answered honestly and they used words like this. Draining, engulfing, demanding, devouring, manipulating, likely to annoy, unlikely to improve. These are direct quotes from nurses and doctors taken from studies and conducted in the 1980s. Almost two decades later, not much had changed. And as you can see, the statistics showed little improvement with medical staff still desperate to push people with BPD away. Thankfully, a 15 year comparison study into the attitudes of clinicians towards BPD, co-authored by Professor Bryn Grenier from Project Air Strategy, who's right there, <laughs> shows that attitudes are improving and that with treatment, it's also becoming more successful. Having said that, we are still worlds away from most other mental health diagnoses and people are still experiencing st stigma and discrimination at alarming rates. So this forced me to ask the question, why do they seem to hate us? The answers help understand their reactions a lot better. Most mental health professionals do not receive appropriate education about people living with BPD. They are uneducated about who we are and what our behaviors truly represent. They work in a system that does not allow adequate time or space for meaningful engagement. They are under-resourced, undereducated and emotionally spent. Therefore, if clinical staff themselves are not able to access support to treat us or taught that we can recover, how can they support, foster hope and recovery within us, the patient? The answer is that they simply can't. This is something that these helping hands can't seem to reconcile. So they create barriers and they stigmatize. 
The real issue is the barrier stigma creates towards recovery. Stigma designs the path to discrimination and discrimination leads to information, lack of information and education. It causes disrespect, neglect, consumer invisibility and isolation. It results in a lack of access to services, the increase of symptoms, both in frequency and severity. It affects the caring relationships between friends and families and leads everyone despondent, desperate and without hope. Like most, I have my own experience of these issues. Stigma and discrimination reinforced what I had known about myself my entire life, and that was that I was unworthy of care and inconvenience and incredibly broken. Through the clinical lack of hope and dismissal and frustration, they recreated the trauma that lived inside of me. With every rejection and discharge, discharge, I became more fused with my negative self-view and lack of hope. Their words blended with my own, and together we created a miserable narrative, a story that was sad and devoid of hope. They had become my new abusers. Many of us have horror stories about ER visits and hospital admissions. Being dismissed, ignored, treated like trash, ridiculed and attacked by staff, suffering berating lectures from nurses and doctors who ask, why do you do this to yourself? We have people here who actually need help. They're really dying. You're just an attention seeker who is choosing to do this and to waste my time. This story is felt by millions and the object of this campaign was to use our voice to amplify our collective need for change. But this voice must include all of us. Carers have historically, perhaps, been our loudest voice. They have also faced incredible stigma and discrimination by many, including doctors, nurses, and the wider community. Their voices have been essential because for many people living with BPD, they could not safely speak up. This is still a massive issue, which is why I see a lot of people suffering in silence but it is changing. I have great admiration and respect for those who have chosen to love us through this illness. Those who have not given up on changing treatment standards, access to care, and work hard to amplify the lived experience voice. It is important to talk about the stigma our clinicians and expert academics also carry. Many clinicians run groups outside their core work some on a volunteer basis. DBT practitioners are asked to step outside many of their acceptable professional boundaries. They are asked to take on patients who require a high level of care, time and accessibility that is not traditionally acceptable within the clinician-patient relationship. They face their own discrimination within their professional community. They experience high levels of burnout, vicarious trauma and self-doubt it is important to me to acknowledge all of those who belong to the BPD community and to acknowledge their strength. We're glad you are here and we need you on our team. So how do we move forward together? Well, first and foremost, it must be together. All of us. Without blame, shame, ego or hierarchy. We work together and we listen to each other and we support each other. We start at the beginning and we educate. We ask questions. We remain open to the answers, no matter how hard they are to hear. We make mistakes. We apologize for them as many times as we need to. We ask for space, we do not take it. We remain quiet and wait to hear. We let the future guide us and we let go of our past. We see the individual and not the disorder. We treat the symptom, not the diagnosis. We follow the human, not the textbook. We shine lights in dark spaces. We provide hope. And when we identify problems, we come with solutions. For the past five years, I've been involved in working to change the narrative of borderline personality disorder. 
through my job as a graphic designer in the not-for-profit sector. I've also learned about raising the profile of hard-to-access issues that many people want to forget about, like substance abuse and gender-based violence. With that in mind, and with the support of my fellow members of the New South Wales branch, branch of the Foundation, I contacted the board of the Australian BPD Foundation and pitched an idea. It was a national strategy to support the 2018 BPD Awareness Week for the an anti-stigma campaign. Not surprisingly, this wasn't a new idea and the foundation had already been brainstorming this. We started by asking a series of simple questions of people living with BPD, their carers and clinicians. So we could begin to design a campaign that would truly address the real needs of our community. It was important to create multiple surveys that each had its own target audience because people who live with BPD are also carers. Carers are also people with lived experience. And clinicians can also have their own lived experience of being a carer. So having four separate surveys meant it was easier for those to fill those multiple roles. They could answer one solely from their lived experience and then put their carer hat on and answer another. These questions, of course, were created, edited, and approved by a cohort of over 30 people who included people with lived experience of BPD, carers, and the clinicians who work with us. And this was the start of the co-design process. Co-design and co-production principles are translated in the design world as a process we call user X. This means that the users and audience design the product with the support of the designer. Consultation and feedback is sought at every point of production in a systemic way that removes hierarchy and the power roles by anonymous input. This means that no one has a more powerful voice than anyone else and decisions are made by majority impact. Co-design has strong evidence-based research behind it and it's a method of design that requires educational specialization. So whilst we waited for the surveys to be answered, the title, No BPD, No Stigma, was decided upon, and I started creating a branding package based on the previous branding packages that included colors, typography, graphic identity marks, and overall concepts. This, as well, was sent to the people with a lived experience, carers, and clinicians, who worked with us for comment, feedback, and evaluation. This was revised three times before final decisions were made, and you can see the method of feedback here. We kept our surveys open as long as possible and encouraged everyone to complete them. These survey links were shared on Facebook and Instagram, not just by our key stakeholder organisations, but by many others, including government and large state peak bodies. These surveys were answered by over 200 unique voices, with people with a lived experience of BPE being the highest category of responders. The next were carers, the wider public and clinicians and researchers. The first thing we wanted to establish is who are we targeting? Where was the need specifically? It was obvious from the research that had been done historically that we were starting at the beginning with BPD. It was relatively unknown by the public and what they did know was completely negative. The data told us what the group had already identified that without a doubt, 100% of clinicians, carers, and people with lived experience identify that both the medical system and the mental health systems contain significant barriers to appropriate treatment for people living with BPD. And that both the medical and mental health systems stigmatized and discriminated against people with a lived experience of BPD. Every single one of our participants answered yes to these questions. It seemed our audience was the systems themselves and the people who design and work within them. They agreed on a couple of other things as well when we asked, what do we need, what is needed to address this? And the top answers included awareness and education, easy to understand explanations of BPD, hearing positive consumer and carer stories, clinician access to training and resources, funding for long-term treatment, promotion of recovery-oriented practices, support for carers, and an end to blaming and shaming behaviours towards consumers. 
It's important for me to state that I read every single word that was written, every single response. Your words are important to me and they guided this work. <coughs> These words led to a tiered design response, visually represented in four separate streams. Infographics. The campaign delivers facts in an accessible way. It aims to be non-threatening. Our facts and information are primarily sourced from the clinical practice guidelines for the management of borderline personality disorder, written in 2012. These facts are then checked with our expert collaboration group. They allow the reader to be educated on specific facts about BPD without becoming overwhelmed by the entire complex picture. All the facts we used are recovery oriented trauma-informed, and strengths-based. I think it skipped one. Yeah, sorry. Hopeful messages. We know there's a lot of negative self, a lot of negative talk surrounding BPD. The campaign acknowledges this and uses a strength-based approach to change the narrative around the words borderline personality disorder. We promote ideas of recovery reframe the struggle and suffering many have faced and celebrate their achievements and what they have overcome. We offer hope, strength and support as a community. The voice of lived experience. Voices are the very heart of who we are and our voices have been silenced for too long. This is important to us, listening to the experts themselves, those with lived experience, like Perian, Carers, like Robin, and our expert academics, like Zakia. Sorry. These graphics also share tips for recovery, self-care, and show real triumph over the struggle. The last year was service support. People who experience BPD report feeling rejected, isolated and unwelcome in many services. Posters created for services to display their engagement in the campaign help to show support to those living with BPD in their lives. And they open a dialogue between services and service users and the wider public. Displaying these messages with pride counteracts the underlying stigma and discrimination that runs through our society and brings the conversation of positive and successful treatment into the world it promotes the hope of recovery. The project was put into the online space by a Facebook and Instagram in August, but brought to the public community space at the 8th Annual National BPD Conference on the 10th and 11th of September in Brisbane. Its official launch, however, was on October 1st, last Monday, the beginning of BPD Awareness Week. During the past week, we've had events in six states and territories across the country. Advocates have been interviewed on radio and for print media. This was made possible by my partner in crime, Karen Bailey, who is not just an organizational powerhouse, but also a carer herself. Karen was also my personal cheerleader and the person that I relied heavily on to keep me motivated, focused, and somewhat sane. She's part of the guiding force behind the South Australian BPD Foundation branch, which is why she obviously isn't here today. I also want to acknowledge the hard work of the Australian BPD Foundation, its board, and the collaboration group for all their feedback, suggestions, content, and guidance on this work, especially that of BPD Foundation President Rita Brown, as well as Jonathan Harms, and Laura Knight, who are the ones behind this event tonight and who keep our New South Wales branch active and impacting. BPD Awareness Week has been a great success, you, but you will notice that most of our resources do not reference the date of this year's Awareness Week. This has been done on purpose to allow the resources to live past this event and become relevant at all times. You'll see a feedback form floating around. It looks like this please complete it for me. Your feedback will guide us further and might even lead to us being able to access funds to keep the campaign going. 
All the resources we created are available for free and to anyone. Although we are hoping to prioritise services for what we have here today. We also have fact and information materials provided by the Australian BPD Foundation, Mental Health Care of New South Wales, Project Air Strategy and Spectrum Personality Disorder Service that are available digitally for free online and they're on the USBs that are in the bowls up there. Um, and some resources obviously here for you to take with you. There are many ways to measure the success of a campaign, like the support that we receive from really large groups, like Sane Australia, Headspace and Mind, or the financial support that we receive from the National Mental Health Commission, or the social media shares and likes that have increased by some staggering numbers. Our resources that have been snapped up so quickly that we barely have anything left. We've seen record engagement numbers with the campaign, as well as organisations that have been supporting it. And all of this has been really, really wonderful. But most importantly, are those of you who have been involved personally your words are these, this campaign, and I hope you know that I hold them seriously and with honour. I believe that we can rewrite the narrative behind BPD and change the conversation. And I thank you for being here and believing in this as well. To all my beautiful and brave consumers out there, the first step to destroying stigma and discrimination is to recover and to become the person that you deserve to be. You can do it. Be patient with yourself, cast aside people who tell you you can't, and find the people who know you can. They are your true allies and your tribe. I hope you take inspiration from the voices of those involved with this campaign, and you remember that they too have struggled and taken their recovery into their own hands. The more success stories we have, the more change we will see and people will change the way they see borderline personality disorder. Let's hope everyone gets to know what it's like to live with BPD, and then we can ask them to say no to stigma. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, we have a time for some questions, if people have questions for Marley. changing the name of it. There is talk. Um, I'm probably not the best person to talk to you because I, I don't believe in that. Um, I believe that much like they did in the schizophrenia movement, um, we need to work on changing the narrative. Um, give us another name and not just discriminate against that name too. Um, also, I kind of look at it, my personal opinion, that that kind of lets them win. It allows them to use, it allows people to use bad behavior, bad stigmatizing language towards someone with a diagnosis and that's what actually has to change. It's the way people think about us, not the fact that it's a name. Um, I personally would probably use um, complex post-traumatic stress disorder to, just, to, to say what I have been through, but that's not the case for everybody diagnosed with BPD and that's also really important. Um, it's a different thing. Um, but yeah, there's a lot to talk about, especially overseas. And look, I think someone like Green will probably know more about that being involved in that and obviously they completely rechanged the classifications of personality disorders. I still really don't understand that. <laughs> Bryn probably does, um, or Ellie. Um, but yeah, there's lots of conversations about it and that's definitely been a conversation that's been had on our social media as well. I think that anything that has disorder tacked onto it needs to be rethinking. Yeah, and I think that's a very personal thing as well. Like I'm, you know, like I said, the worst person to ask because I, identify with um, my diagnosis. It was a good thing for me. It was a relief to me. Um, I'm very proud of it because I survived it. Um, and so I'm not someone that wants to push it away from them, but that's me. And, and I'm very different from everyone else, obviously, so. I might just say that uh, we have uh, lots of debates in mental health about the names of things, from consumer to carer yeah. to BPD. 
Uh, <clears throat> but I do like what uh, I heard someone say at the conference a few years ago, that if they were going to change it, it would be to highly sensitive soul. Because <laughs> yeah. it is really about people who are very sensitive and who develop some maladaptive coping strategies as a result. And you can make almost complete recoveries if they're given the right support. And that's a, a great uh, message for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, I heard that some people are calling, I'm not sure if this is the US or UK, but something called emotional dysregulation or something like that. And I was like, that is the, no. <laughs> I'm like, that is the most horrible thing. Yeah. Like, you know, and there was another one that where people were talking about, you know, like, um, unstable relationship disorder or something. And I was like, no, again, <laughs> no. So in a way, I kind of like that borderline personality disorder says nothing in and of itself. It means nothing really to like you know everyday people. So in a way, I kind of think that's good because it actually doesn't say like this is a person who has problems with their emotions or this is a person who has problems with relationships or it's a little bit vague, which I guess could be a good thing. <laughs> um, but I, I just I just kind of don't see the point as well as like obviously as well. I worked really hard on this and I'm not changing it now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so from a design perspective, no. <laughs> um, but yeah. So it is difficult, I have to say as a designer, it's actually really difficult to design something called borderline personality disorder because it's incredibly wrong, long, which is why um, we did obviously bring it down to BPD, but I did get feedback saying that not everybody knew what that, uh, that um, stood for and that in the US they, they use BD to um, explain bipolar disorder. Um, so that was an interesting bit of feedback and, and funnily enough, something that was not picked up by any of the 30 people <laughs> in our in our group. So, and that's probably because we know what it means and we're so used to using that term. So that was really good feedback. So I think that um, if we get some money to do this again, um, we might be able to change that. So it was a good lesson. Yeah. Sorry it was so boring, but I'm a designer. So. <laughs> <laughs> a rose by any other name will still benefit from a bit of therapy sometimes. So uh, if we, uh, well, look, I'd like to thank Marley for her excellent work and her wonderful <laughs>